do you have you heard from Kelly Athena? Because no. I know I'm going to reach out now, but we're recording. So if we need to okay. catch up, we can do that. Okay. Because um, I don't want to put you out by not having Kelly here. Um, um, okay. So we are recording. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling the Community Resources Committee uh, meeting to order at 4.32 on February 9th, 2023. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted by a remote means, members of the public who wish to access. Um, the meeting may do so by Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted. Every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Um, with that, we're going to announce that we are recording, um, and we're also going to announce that, well, we're going to take roll call to make sure that everyone can be heard and hear. Um, so in alphabetical order, right now we are missing Shalini Balmilne and Pat DeAngelis, so Mandy is present, Pam. Present. And Jennifer. Present. We are expecting at least there is Shalini. I will wait until we've got Shalini connected. Shalini, are you present? Can you hear us? You look unmuted. So Shalini, can you hear us? So yes, now I get it. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm like, why can't I do that? You're doing it. You're doing it. Sorry about that. Oh, oh. Someone is double connected. I'm going to, I'm muting Shalini. I think Shalini might have some sort of odd going on, but maybe it was Kelly. Um, We'll see. Welcome, Kelly. Kelly is our minute taker. Um, so we just called to order at 432, Kelly, and we did announce recording and do the roll call. Pat DeAngelis is absent at this point. Thank you very much. You're welcome. With that, um, we're going to move right on to our agenda. Um, we're starting with a review of the draft bylaw and draft regulations. We're actually not going to deal with the fee schedule today. Um, so I should have deleted that from there. But um, we're going to start with the draft bylaw. I believe I asked everyone to come ready for the sections they wanted to um, discuss. Give me a second and I will put it up on the screen. I've got extra buttons because I've been made host. So. Um, so this is um, the draft that is in the packet. Um, we're going to start at the top um, and I'm just going to trust that anyone who has a desire to um, request some changes to it, raises their hands as we go section by section. So um, it would be nice, and, and I'm gonna try and keep the hands, I just, by doing that, lost my hands. So um, I'm trying here to juggle multiple screens. Um, okay, so um, Pam, we're, we're gonna start with the, the data block and section A purpose. Um, so Pam, you've got your hands up. Yeah. Oh, wait, before, before you start, Pam, sorry. One of the things I intend to do today, we'll see if we can reach consensus on any requested changes. If we can't, if there's an objection, we'll actually take a straw poll, um, and see if there's a vote one way or the other to see we are missing one member. If there is a tie vote, um, I will make a note in the comments to re-vote at another meeting, um, and, and do it that way. Does that make some sense? Um, so that we can get to a document, um, but I'm hoping we can reach consensus on as many changes as possible so that we don't have to do this. Does it stay in or out based on a vote? Um, Jennifer. Question. So I just I wanted to ask, I don't know if this is, um, so I met with actually a constituent and spoke with somebody else who's a landlord 
and they had some requested changes. And should I present those now or should I wait till after the listening session? I didn't know what. So that should be, they should, if they can, they should make those requests at the listening session, which would be for that. And then we can make note of those and then discuss them after they have been made there. Um, or I, I, that that would be my preferred because then we get to hear who it came from, right? Um, but if you're willing to disclose names, we can do that now and discuss some of that too. Um, otherwise, I would request that they try to email the committee first um, or come to the listening session and then we can discuss them the next time we take it up after the listening session. Okay. okay. Pam, you had your hand up. Yeah, I did. Um, and when you say listening session, you don't mean public comment today? I mean, public oh, comment today. Public comment today is also fine, right? Yes. <laughs> or Monday's listening session. Yes. Okay. So section A, um, if you actually read these items, one, two, three, four, and five, um, one and two are, are extremely redundant. And so I'm suggesting that we um, we take number two and, and make that essentially the first sentence and it goes to implement a proactive inspection program to eliminate housing blight and to ensure the safety, health and welfare of its residents through per permitting. So it combines sentence one and sentence two and it, and it And then, and then, so eliminate, yeah, most of, right. So it eliminates most of number one. And then number three is says almost exactly the same thing um, because we're talking about a, you know, a permitting process. And so number three, monitor and enhance compliance with basic life safety and sanitary codes is exactly the same as number one. So I'm suggesting we eliminate number three as well. That's this current number two, right? Correct. Yes. Yes. And then if we wanted to add something back in that we don't seem to have or that seems to have been lost is is the suggestion to incentivize efficient uh, energy efficiency in our rental housing stock. And we have yet to sort of agree how appropriate that is and and how to do it. Was that removed because somebody requested it? I don't remember. It was in an earlier version, so I don't know. I don't know how it. Hmm. You see, I tell them what I have, but, but. How was that one worded? Um, to incentivize energy efficiency in rental housing stock. In the, actually, what I have is in the portion of housing stock that is a rental property. Okay. So I don't know if that means if you have a ADU, the part you rent should. Now, one of the people I spoke to actually asked if that be removed, <laughs> but we can discuss that. Yeah, so we can discuss it. Um, I'm just typing so that people can see what has what is proposed, right? Yeah. And so um, let's start with essentially what I would say is Pam's request to combine one, the original one, two, and three. Um, so delete one and original one and three, and combine that into sort of number, the new number one. What was number two? Um, any concerns with that? Oh, and, and while we're doing this, John and Rob, if you have any concerns about any section two, speak up as we get to those sections too, any requested changes or anything in those sections. This is a committee plus John and Rob, bring what you want to see changed or added to it. I am not hearing any concerns with that change. So let's talk about the energy efficiency one. Um, Jennifer, you said someone requested it come out. Well, this is, I guess, maybe a bigger conversation and, and it may be um, expressed at the listening session. But I think there's some concern that 
the rental properties. And there's a reason for doing that, but on the part of some uh, prop landlords that they're being held, that they're burdensome and maybe being held to a different standard that owner, you know, individual homeowners aren't. So that, you know, I was just wanted to communicate what had been expressed. Yep, no, no, that's, that's, that's perfectly good. Um, it was one of our original goals, right, is to right. address climate action, which is different right. than incentivize energy efficiency, right, in some sense, um, those have different meanings. Um, my concern with this language versus address climate action goals um, is the bylaw, at least at this point, doesn't really incentivize energy efficiency, right? We haven't found a way to incentivize. You know, we had talked about earlier on things about decreased permit fees or decreased inspection fees or longer inspection, to, you know, timeframes or permit timeframes or something as it relates to the more energy efficiency efficient you get. We haven't really done any of that. So it seems weird to put to me to put a purpose in of incentivizing energy efficiency when we haven't actually done any of that within the bylaw or regs versus collecting the energy efficiency data, which is different. Um, so I, I don't know what to do with it, but that's one of my thoughts initially. Shalini. Is it still sounding funky or is it? No, no, okay. you're good. All right. Uh, I was thinking like having that as a long-term goal is a good idea. And then the fact that we haven't figured out a way to do it in a way that it's not burdensome to some landlords or to, you know, some tenants and things like that, we're not yet proposing anything, but to include it as a goal, I think is a good thing. Oh, and yeah, Rob's hands up. Thank you, Shalini. Rob. Uh, so yeah, I agree about incentivizing has to come with the, the, the rest of the, the pieces, but it could be encouraged if we wanted to keep something in for energy efficiency, because, you know, as the code enforcement officers out looking at repairs and upgrades, um, it's certainly appropriate to apply the latest energy code for that work and encourage, um, you know, the best as far as energy efficiency is concerned. I'm, I'm certainly comfortable with that. <clears throat> Me too. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that suggestion. I, I think that satisfies many of our concerns, Rob. So and and a great way to do it is through those inspections. Um any other thoughts on purpose before we move on? Shalini. Uh, from the survey data, there was uh quite a bit of mention of in incentivizing you know landlords that were really taking care of their tenants, taking care of the homes. And it may not be the overall purpose. It's like, I think that purpose serves the purpose of having good quality neighborhoods, homes, you know, good quality. So I don't know if that in itself needs to be highlighted as a purpose, but I think having it in purpose sends out a message to maybe the landlord community that, you know, hey, we're really supporting, encouraging home, um, uh, rental landlords who are, are taking care of the tenants, taking care of their properties. How would you recommend we get that in there if you were recommending something? Maybe something like to incentivize um, landlords that men good quality rental homes and relationships with tenants and neighbors. Could we use Rob's word encourage again? Yeah, encourage or something. Yeah. And maybe they're two separate things because I guess they're interrelated because relationships with neighbors means you're listening to what are the concerns of the neighbors and you know responding to it and with tenants of course it's maintaining the safety and all okay rob yes thank you rob uh yeah i was just going to suggest maybe recognize those better performing properties for those reasons um as a thought just um you know at the very least we you know, would be able to uh, publicly display the results of inspections and um, see that properties are in good standing and maybe in time it would be more than that. 
uh, leading, you know, towards some kind of uh, program that incentivizes. And so recognize properties that that are well maintained and yeah. dry. I really have that A for restaurant ratings. <laughs> right. Like how do we word that though, right? Um, I was gonna say regularly comply with this bylaw or something. That sounds so weird though. But maintain the quality of quality and safety of homes. Rental homes, no. That should be a given. That's you know, we're just saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, hmm. uh, recognize compliant properties or something. How about the uh, the part about maintaining? relationships I mean don't write it down I'm just saying that as a thought that like who are responsive to neighbors and tenants needs something like that do we want to say anything about that or no I mean I think that's a good purpose you know it, it is yeah because it's not a purpose of, it's a yeah I think that's true and it was sort of, I think, mentioned a lot in terms of there were some uh, tenants who said, like, we really appreciate our landlords who take care of us. And so maybe encouraging more of that. And then residents who were like, some of them were like, hey, we can't ever reach the landlords. We don't even know where they are. They never respond. And then there are some landlords who are very responsive. So I think that's the distinguishing factor where the landlords feel like they're responsive to the tenants and neighbors needs. Okay, so I've marked that we just have to work on the language. Mm -hmm. But I, I've marked that we have to add the language in so that we can move on as we work yeah. on that. <laughs> Sound good? And I think it should be a separate item. Okay. Um, Agree. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Noted and we'll come back to it. Well, I'll, we'll work on language for the next draft. Okay, moving on to definitions. Any requests for re-looking at or considering consideration of definitions? Pam. Yes, um, we somehow have lost the definition of a student home. I think that might be because we don't use it anywhere then we need to use it somewhere. So the only place at one point it was used was somewhere about the application and identifying students or units that have students in them and that is in the regulations now. Then we still should then we still should define it unless we unless we define it in the regulations, which I don't remember. So it was defined in the regulations through that application section. When we get there, I can see it. So I can't see. Yeah. So it, it's not used anywhere in this bylaw, which I think is why it got deleted. Can we put it in the, as a placeholder here and then we come back to it to make sure that it's been maintained somewhere? So what would it, if it's not referenced in the bylaw, it doesn't belong in definitions because definitions should be used somewhere in the bylaw. And so are you proposing to add that use somewhere in the bylaw? Yes. Okay. And we had, we had a definition from no, I, previous version. Okay. Um, Thank you. I, I, at this point, I'm not for it until we figure out whether it gets used in the bylaw. So I'm putting it in temporarily, but I, it, it won't go in unless we've used it somewhere in the bylaw. At least my opinion is it shouldn't be there unless we actually use it somewhere in the bylaw. Got it. Um, and I think that might've been why Shalini was raising her hand. Okay, I want to look at occupant. 
Um, any person living or sleeping in or having actual possession of a dwelling, dwelling unit or rooming unit. Um, I think it's kind of vague. I know when KP Law was here, Pam, you talked about, I don't know whether you were talking about anyone on the lease, but not, you know, occupants were only those on the lease or not. I don't know where you fell, but I was looking at this definition and I said, living, sleeping in, does that mean guests as we're talking about what occupant is used for in this bylaw? And I think we need, I, I don't know what the answer is, but occupants for the purpose of this bylaw, you know, this is not talking about sort of you know, the nuisance issues, right? Or something where a visitor that's an overnight stayer for two nights would count as an occupant because they're doing other things. I think we use occupant more um, as sort of those who have made it their residence for the year. Um, so I don't know, I, I just wanted to revisit it. I was concerned about the sleeping in portion um, because that's very vague. Shalini. Yeah, I think it's defining the number of days they live there. It is that is the time period, maybe like if they've lived consecutively over the last 30 days or something like that. that makes a person an occupant i'd be curious to see what the staff thing i mean what john and rob think also. i'd also be curious to know is an occupant different than a tenant i'm sorry to interrupt but okay. so let, let's go to john is that okay pam <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely yeah uh, shalin is right there's there's language in uh, mass general law about um how long you're there before you're considered an occupant. I don't I don't know it offhand, but um, we could look it up. Okay, so maybe the answer is look up the general laws on this one and match the definition there. Yeah. Um, just in response to that, if if I just signed a lease and I'm <clears throat> one week in, I'm still an occupant and I'm and I'm a tenant. So I and maybe I have my name on the lease. Hopefully I have my name on the lease. Um, so let's see what the real wording is, but I I'm not uncomfortable with um it implies that you spend sleeping time there. It might just need some sort of intention language or intending to reside there or something like I, I just I think we can clean it up or make it a little more clear. Okay, any other definitional requests? Then moving on to section C, anything with section C? Oh, I, I had a oh, Jennifer? I had one question and again, this was asked it was number 10 of owner occupants so i guess this gets back to could an owner if an owner lives across the street or next door did we i think we discussed that early on so right now the definition matches the zoning bylaw because we've tried to not recreate definitions or con have conflicting definitions, right? Um, that zoning bylaw, as far as I know, you have to be on the property, but I'm sure Rob or John could, could clarify that, um, that across the street is not an owner occupant. Rob. Uh, yes, that's right. It has to, the, the owner has to occupy the dwelling unit and establish uh, principal residence there, both defined in the zoning bylaw. And if we wanted to, I'm not saying we do, but this it came up in this context. If you wanted to have a different permitting fee, if you live next door, I don't know, that we would discuss under fee and not here, correct? I think so, yeah. 
Pam. That, well, that's a that's actually a really good conversation because <clears throat> we've talked about owner adjacent uh, as as opposed to owner owner occupant, but but owner adjacent um, implies that it's next door. It's it's on the same block. It's you know a ten minute walk away. It it is the presence of that of that owner and eyes on the property, and that's it's a little hard to define, isn't it? Because it because it you could have a really good owner adjacent um, who lives a half a mile away. So if there's a way to describe it in some way, I would be all for that because it's it's roughly the equivalent of being an owner occupant with primary residence on that property? Um, I would say yes and no, because one of the things, this is why I was searching for it. Um, one of the things we exempt from inspections is the unit occupied by the owner. Um, and if you're an owner adjacent, in, potentially your property isn't even subject to the bylaw itself, especially if as an owner you're you know, and so I, for fees maybe, but I'm not, I, I, I'd have to go through all of these owner occupant references to see whether owner adjacent makes sense in them, because I know for some of them, it wouldn't make sense because the permitting bylaw doesn't apply to the parcel the owner lives in if they're owner adjacent and it's a, they're a single family home. If they are, if they are, if they are not renting to themselves, it would not be part of this conversation. Right. Yeah. And so I just don't know how that might work, Jennifer. Yeah, I think it's, you know, owner adjacent. I think we'd have to be really. I think it came up if somebody said, you know, I, I am an owner occupant in the house I live in, and then I own the house next door. So maybe we could look at it for fee. I know it came up way back 13 years ago and it would did not fly. Somebody tried to make the case that in terms of having no limit to how many people you had there, you could say you were an owner occupant up to 12 properties and that or 10 properties and that doesn't, you know, somebody could really try and take advantage of that situation. So I think we should we should probably stick to it in the fees. Yeah. Any other Request for changes to definitions. Jennifer, your hand is still raised. No, sorry. Section C. Yeah. I'll include section D on this one. Section D. Um, anything with section D? Then section E. So I have one thing with section E and it goes to this comment that still remains here of the revisit, which is from a prior set of conversations we had as a CRC um, that we've never revisited, which is um, where do the public private partnership dorms fall under this? And um, I think Rob, you said at one point the dorm is not owned by the educational institution, but the land is owned by the educational institution. Um, so would under the current use here of exemptions, dorms owned by educational institutions and located in the ED district, um, would that mean that the dorm going up on UMass land at Lincoln and uh, Mass Ave, not be exempted from this bylaw? So we might want to clarify that, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> and the question is, do we want a dorm like that exempted from the bylaw? <laughs> I think we, we might be able, we might see both situations going forward. You know, dormitories that are uh, privately owned on educational owned land and you know some cases where the dormitory is also owned by the the university so i think we just need to make it work for both situations whichever way we want it to be jennifer and pam i just wanted to ask so rob you'll inspect those buildings 
so I actually won't inspect those buildings that are being built there uh, right now because the agreement has the university owning the building as well as the property. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that took us out of it, but okay. in a case where the, the building is owned by some entity other than the university, like the, um, the Newman Center, it's on university land, but not owned by the university, that becomes a, a building that we permit and we inspect regularly. So I do think, and you know, just the, the discussions with possibly development at Hampshire College, it could be the same way, privately owned um on on college land in the ed district all kinds of things could happen so um i think we'll see both in the future pam i had remembered i think it must have been rob saying that that in this case mass uh, umass had was owning the land and i because i remember saying that's because they, that's because they don't want to pay taxes on it so um i'm i'm agreeing but it would be it would be good to cover this somehow. So the question I have for Rob is uh, a building like the Newman Center that is owned privately, do you want it to, what What do you, in terms of dorms and buildings owned that are on ED land, whether it be UMass Hampshire College or Amherst College, do you want them to apply to this bylaw? Do you want, you know, do you want this bylaw to apply to them? I think so. I think so too, only because I, you know, there could be, there could be um, residential units that are not maybe what we're thinking of right now as a traditional dormitory um, that we'd want to have in the program. So I, I think we'd want to be able to permit those. All dorms or just those that are owned privately? Those, those that are owned privately. Okay. So that means the current language is what you would want to see. I think so, but willing to listen. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone want to change it? See none, any other requests regarding section E? See none, we're moving on to F. Um, and since we can only see what's on F on this page, We'll do F1, 2, and 3. And then we'll scroll down to the next page. Um, so I have something in F, but I'll start with Shalini and then John. Let's start with John. John? Uh, just an editing uh, thing. A separate residential re rental permit, maybe. It's that's two words, right? Uh, where are we? Oh, here. Yep. You don't want to think of like the question, maybe. <laughs> those those leap off the page at me. Uh, Shalini. Um, I don't know if this is here, but we've been getting those suggestions where the rental registration requires the landlord to put the names of the tenants. It, would that be something that we consider here or later? Um, so that's under the application regulations right now in terms of, I think, where the names of the tenants would, would we ask for them on the application or not? And that's at regulations. Okay. Uh, but just, to, uh, just for my curiosity, do we currently have the tenants names on the no we don't okay i get the tenants names when i request a lease mm -hmm. okay pam um under number three uh three c i just want to make sure that we um we've spent a fair amount of time but we haven't really discussed the nuisance bylaw yet and so this says that it's um, uh, a, a permit wouldn't be issued if um, if the current if the property is currently subject to a suspension or revocation order or has been sub suspended under the provisions of this bylaw during the prior X years. And I think that I'd like to hold this open until we kind of clarify what the nuisance 
tally is, what constitutes the, the problem property and then the nuisance property. I think that has more to do with violations than it does length of time. So I don't I don't feel like I could answer this fill in the green box yet. Okay, that section was the section I had two requests for. Um, you mentioned both sort of, but I have different requests. Um, I would actually request that we delete the phrase has been suspended under the provisions of this bylaw during the prior X years. Um, that almost seems like an extra penalty for violating the bylaw if you're suspended, you know, if you're actively suspended, right, current sus suspension, you can't get a permit, right, because it's suspended, right, but once that suspension is over, if we then say, well, you were suspended three years ago, so you no longer can get it for three years, that actually dings to me as well, the suspension is not six months. The suspension is now three years or whatever number we'd put in here. And that doesn't sit right with me. Um, so I would say if we're actively under suspension, you can't get a permit, but you shouldn't be able to say, well, you had a suspension three years ago, so we're still not going to give you a permit. Or we suspended it for six months, but you know, under F3, that actually means a full year and a half. Um, it just doesn't sit right with me. So I would delete that phrase. I, I, I'm looking to delete that phrase because of that reason. And then the designated nuisance property, um, I think we need to put a time frame in that one. So I would add within the last 12 months or something, because right now it reads, if in any point in time in your entire history, you've been designated a nuisance property, you can no longer get a rental permit. Again, that goes to that due process issues that um, KP Law, when we had them here, were really concerned about both of those ones. So I'm I'm asking for a deletion of the second phrase, the suspension during the prior X years, because that's really, to me, a due process issue that automatically lengthens the suspension beyond what was issued under the next se section. And then under this one, I think for due process reasons, we need to designate a certain number of years. Um, okay, so can we can we talk through what that means? So if if the, the property has been designated nuisance property within the last lease period, that means it was it was fresh off the block. It it got it it got the penalties. Um, maybe it was or wasn't suspended completely, maybe they fixed the issue. Um, or we could say within the previous lease period, because that would give that would give a starting point for the new new lease year to begin, I'll just say accruing penalties again, accruing violations again. I would go with the prior 12 months. Um, you know, as for six months or something, if we kept it in, I'm for the nuisance property one. Um, I wouldn't take it to lease periods because our permit system goes um, July to June, no matter when you apply. Um, so a lease can go any other time. You don't know when a lease is going. So I would rather sort of keep it on a month or calendar year or some other basis if we're going to keep this being designated a nuisance property um, requires, this one means it requires suspension. It requires denial if it's currently designated a nuisance property. Okay, Pam, Jennifer, then John. Um, I think I think I can follow that. I think um, if it's been designated use of property within within twelve months, because the other part of it was is if the property is currently subject to a suspension or revocation. So I think that's that's fine. There's there's current activity and then there's recent past activity and they're both covered. Yeah. Jennifer, then John. Okay, so my question was um, 
Okay, so we said, let's say you, you really maybe can't suspend or revoke a permit during the lease period because it, it's, you really can't, um, you know, unless the house is condemned, if I'm understanding it correctly, you can't evict the tenants, you know, during the lease. So that's a very cumbersome process if we would even want to go there. So weren't we talking about that if it's a real problem property, short of it having to be condemned, like, you know, 11 Allen Street, that we would wait until it, it would be revoked, the permit would be revoked or suspended starting at the next lease period. So I don't know if that complicates the time frame. Just a question. Um, John, and then we'll see if Rob's got any thoughts on this section. John. I'm just thinking about a property that I'm working on now. It's um, It's been kind of a problem property and I've got an active order to correct on it, but it's just changed hands in the first of December. And, um, you know, the tenants that are in it are the tenants that were inherited in the purchase. This seems like it kind of dings the new owner. They're not really they're not to blame for what's gone on at this property and they they might be able to change the culture i know from speaking to them that the lease with this bunch is up at the end of may and they don't plan to renew it with them um you know this um this could this could hurt um people who buy properties like this in the in the middle of a lease term um, Rob, do you have any thoughts on Section C, 3C? I'm uh, just wondering what would we do with, um, you know, when, when the permit's being renewed and the lease is already signed, which it often is the case, that, that they already have a fully executed lease for, for the upcoming uh, season. Um, I'm not sure what that would mean. I mean, technically, they'd be in violation of the bylaw, and there'd be a three hundred, potentially a three hundred dollar a day fine going to the owner, right? I mean, if you issue the suspension order starting at the end of the lease period, and the owner still signs a lease anyway, you're in the no, same no. boat, right? Well, that's that's not that's not the case here. This is this is a permit denial, not a suspension. So the app the applications made, they were designated uh, nuisance property. Two months ago or six months ago doesn't matter, but they already have their lease signed for the the next tenants that are coming in when they're filing the application on July first. Because they do these way in advance, right? They they often do them way in advance. Yes. So denying it, we would we would run into problems with uh, an executed lease. But wouldn't that be the kind of landlord's issue? You know, if they if they were in violation of the terms of having a rental permit, it seems to me the town wouldn't be responsible for what happens with the lease that's signed for the next period. Right, but it's the same reason why we, when we look at suspension, we put it off until the end of the lease term so we don't have to get into those legal challenges between tenant and landlord and eviction. But would we in this case, because you're not evicting someone, I mean, they can't- No, they wouldn't They wouldn't be delivering the unit. Right, but what would happen if it was condemned? Let's say they still, the tenants wouldn't be able to move in. They, yeah, that would be different, right. If so it was condemned, they, 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 if it was condemned, they couldn't move in and the, the owner's responsible for, um, whatever financial responsibility is to provide other housing or um, whatever now, payment but might, would be made. Might the owner have to do it in this case? I mean, they, they're, they have a problem or nuisance property, so they cannot renew their permit for the next lease period. So it seems that they're responsible for making good on what they've, the contract they've entered into or the lease agreement with their tenants for the next year because they have not followed the bylaw. I mean, I just don't see where 
And so then we could never suspend or revoke. Well, I guess my uh, what, what I'm concerned about, I guess, is, you know, based on what we talked about last meeting. So three trash violations 11 months ago will cause a permit to be denied because it received a designation, a designation of a nuisance property. So we have to wait a month before we can issue that permit. So we have a month with a signed lease that, that we're gonna have to figure out what, well, the owners got to figure out, you're right, is what to do, but you know we know how that goes. So I just, just wondering about the situations we would be creating with this. Pam? Is there any way to flag, um, flag a, a violation or a pending um, like problem once it's a problem house, just be really clear in that in that process and somehow have a, a standing list that um, the following properties are have been designated problem problem properties. It's a, it's a prelude to a nuisance property. It's a prelude to having a, a permit denied, and and that notification to that owner at the problem property point says, "Beware, you know, when you when you go to sign up people for your for next year's lease, you need to have these problems, these issues solved, so that you don't get yourself into a pickle." Could instead of the designated a nuisance property within the previous 12 months be similar to, could we rephrase that so it is currently designated a nuisance property? Like, would, would that potentially, Rob, solve some of your concerns? Similar to is currently subject to a suspension or revocation order, is currently designated a nuisance property? Because presumably, I mean, we don't know what this bylaw, the nuisance property bylaw looks like right now right we're still in the middle of it but presumably once things are fixed you might be able to undesignate it a nuisance property right um yeah and that, so that and that's what i was thinking is yeah, i i i think that could work but we have to make sure we're clear what it, what it means to be currently a nuisance property and when does that end and and that'll probably happen in that bylaw Pam? Yeah, so within, instead of within the, the, the past or prior 12 months, it, I think I think current does kind of work. Okay. Or at least Any, we, we can put it in as, we can put it in. For now. But yeah. yeah. Shalini, before we move on to F4 and below. I think we're gonna discuss this more in the nuisance um, bylaw itself, but I'm just thinking that what we are hoping to create here is a system where the landlords get enough notice and the town staff is helping them solve the cause and conditions for them failing. And like, it doesn't just mean like, oh, there was this litter on the yard, one, two, three, and they're out kind of a thing. It's more like working with the landlords to make sure that the landlords have created a system and it happens the first time and they clean it, but then it happens again a second time. So the second time is where like, what is the system you have put in place to make sure that this is not happening again? Have you hired a, you know, cleaning, whatever. I spoke to a bunch of different landlords and they were all saying that, yeah, we contract with and we build the tenants, but we have contracted with um, companies. Of course, it comes down to the smaller landlords who don't have contractual. And I was, you know, we were renting in Utah and we couldn't be, we didn't have a management company. So if anything happened and we were renting to students in a rental in a neighborhood and it was a big issue for the neighbors, but we were you know, stuck. But I'm just thinking like, there are all these different things that happen. It really hurts the smaller landlords who are just trying to, I don't know, whatever. So we're going to go into more detail, but I'm hoping that the system doesn't just sound like we are penalizing and, you know, it's game over, but we're working with the landlords to have a system in place. Does that seem like it's doable? 
I mean, I think that's the goal of this one and that tiered system under the redraft of the nuisance property bylaw that we'll get to at future meetings. So it should, yeah. So then it shouldn't come to the point where they've uh, leased out again when they already have this current nuisance thing they haven't figured out. So which is why the current makes sense, I guess. We're going to move on to the rest of section F four, five, six, seven, and eight. Anything? Seeing none, anything with section G? Let's do G1 application requirements. And many, again, a reminder, many of the requirements have been moved to the um, regulations, which if we get through this in the next eight minutes, we'll be able to start first <laughs> the next time we bring these up. Um, but yeah, so that, that question you had, Shalini, about tenant names and all would be dealt with in the regulations. Anything with application requirements? Seeing none, um, application process or fees. And then we'll move on. So F2 or H. Uh, I had something with H2. Um, this phrase unpaid units. So I think my comment is right now it says a late fee charge equal in amount to the required permit fee per unpaid unit shall be imposed. I think it just should say required permit fee shall be imposed because um, we haven't been doing permit. It, it, I think we that phrase, not knowing what the structure will look like, I think the phrase is what we want. We just want an equal amount to the permit fee, period. Yeah, yeah. I think it's that. And then it would just be a late fee and charge an equal in amount to the required permit fee shall be imposed after the date of the permit payment due. That's a weird phrasing. Maybe we'll fix that one. And every 30 days thereafter. <laughs> um, okay, anything else in fees or application process? See, none I inspections. I can't put it all on the on the page, but anything in I1. I know there's a two, three, or four. So we're just dealing with anything in I1. I almost had all of I1. So two, three, four, five, six. Section J, that one's fairly straightforward. Hold on, hold on, can we go back please? Sure. Um, the energy efficiency standards, so that was, that was I2. Two. Since we just had that conversation, proof of compliance with residential rental property energy efficiency standards adopted by regulation under this bylaw should be permitted, should be submitted with the application. We don't know if we're gonna do that, um if it, if there's zero requirement in our in our bylaws then we shouldn't be mentioning it here and um if we're so, just place holding that's that's i guess okay so the regulations have some standards in there or energy it's it's not standards maybe the word is energy efficiency requirements or something um because the regulations right now have some requirements in there that they would have to submit proof for they're not really standards at this point, but they're requirements. Well, we haven't talked about them yet. Right. Um, but right now they do. Um, so we can change this to requirements. Um, and if we delete that in the regulations, we would come back and delete that here. Right. So maybe we just make a note to that effect. Yep. Jennifer. Yeah, I have, I'm sorry to take us back to um, under application G, it's a little long, D1. So it has to do with additional information concerning each residential rental property as set forth in regulations adopted under this bylaw, including but not limited 
too. So yeah. I, again, this was something that was brought to me, but is that when you get into um, envelope efficiency presence, I and mean, this is just something that the inspector is going to note, or is that something that will be on the um, application for it, permit? Right now, it would have to be on the application as questions that the applicant would have to fill out. Um, if we're concerned with the specificity of this, one thing we could do is just have D say, stop it, stop it, the word under this bylaw, period. And then in the regulations, if we still wanted to do energy efficiency, we could do it there. Um, because, it, you know, we definitely need D up to under this bylaw. Um, because that's how we add everything else right. in the so regulations. So I'm not, I mean, I, I know that we want to, you know, be able to have the information on, you know, how energy efficient and what is, is being done to help, you know, be, become more efficient in all, you know, our dwellings in, in town. So I'm kind of torn here, but I feel like if, if there's a way, if there are things that are feeling really overly burdensome, you know, where we can help ease that, it would be yeah. nice to do that. So the thing, the thing to do might be to delete it from the bylaw, but potentially keep it in the regulations that would give us more flexibility if we're looking for flexibility once a bylaw is adopted to tailor the regulations um, to what's necessary. Because if it's in the bylaw, they have to ask, right? right? And so with this number one, you have to ask about all of this. So John and Rob, I mean, what do you think of this? <laughs> I'm not sure they have comments or want to make them. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm trying to think of any places I've been in that, you know, in, in my previous incarnation as a builder, I built high efficiency homes and i can't think of any rental units i've been in that i would call high efficiency if th this is fine to keep in there if you want to use it as a way to collect information and right. i think that's probably valuable okay then maybe we should i mean i'm not i i do there and i think that is probably the intent of why it was there was to gather information uh pam yeah i think um I would I would actually like to see it go to the regulations because I think we haven't determined yet the the extent to which we collect information about energy efficiency and who's actually collecting the data and who's using using it. What would the, what would the information be used for? So um, rather than tie up a, a bylaw with any kind of future manipulations of it, um, that's pretty pretty onerous. So I wouldn't mind seeing that section one go to um, go to regulations. So I have temporarily thrown it into a comment in the latest regulation document so that we don't forget to deal with it there. So, um, and it then adds more flexibility to change what we're asking for too. Okay, um, back to we were on. Um, I think we were on. Um, we were here. I and yeah, so I think we're moved on to K, but we were on I and the energy efficiency. We noted that we have to make sure it confirms to the regulations if there are no standards or requirements there to start, maybe we don't want to put it in. Um, or maybe we want a different wording. So I've noted that. Anything else before we go to K? Disclosure and notification requirements. Shalini. So <clears throat> for the occupancy limits, do we... Um, like, what is the proof of compliance that is asked and how, how, I guess enforcement is later, but at this point, what is the proof? Rob or John, how would they prove that on an application? I mean, is this where we're asking for leases, Rob? uh well i think they're just plugging in a number right in the application process Four. 
Okay. Shalini, Shalini, yeah, no, go ahead. Sam, go ahead. Is your, is, Shalini, is your question, how do you actually prove the number of occupants or, or is it a valid thing to ask on the, on the form? Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to understand what are we, I mean, I guess we're trying to get a confirmation from them that they're sticking to the occupancy limits, but what do we take as evidence that they are for that? Is it the lease or is it just the end of the number we're taking their word for it? So they have to somehow, right as it's written, in order to get a permit, they have to prove compliance with the occupancy limits and they have to prove compliance with all laws and regulations. Um, and how do they prove that? And how do they prove that is the question, right? Um, I mean, I guess, Rob and John, how would you have them prove compliance with items three and four? Five and six is because we're asking them to submit plans. So that that's the proof. But three and four, what would you say proves compliance with three and four? Yeah, I wonder if proof is the right word for that um, because I don't know how they could prove compliance without providing something like a lease um and laws and laws and regulation comp compliance with laws and regulation that's more like the kind of the self-certification process that we have now they can check a box that, saying that they they are in compliance with uh so some sort of a statement uh it might be a simple it might be that you know maybe we make a statement you know that they're they're checking off and and signing to that they're in compliance with both occupancy limits and applicable laws and regulations yeah less a uh, uh, truth uh, you know a proof and more an acknowledgement um hereby acknowledging that i'm in compliance with occupancy limits mm -hmm. so i'm just going to conform this one to the last one Sadly, we shouldn't have to say that because it's already in the zoning bylaws. But yeah, I mean, so does number three need said at all if they're checking off compliance with local bylaws and regulations as well as state fire? Is three duplicative of four or a subset of four? It's still needed. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's. I think so too. So just to check off on the application that they comply with, and then because of all the other things about the truthfulness of those that's where if they weren't truthful there and you went in and saw it wasn't that that's where you could cite them for putting in a non-truthful application or something hammer time okay that works shall i okay so we're going to stop here i'm going to make a note that we start at k the next time we bring this up um, because i want to move on to the next agenda item um if we end that agenda item before 6 30 we'll come back to this agenda item again um but i, I want to move on to that one um so we are going to stop this share um the next agenda item is um review and possible vote on the report, the engagement report um, that Shalini has been working on. Um, Shalini, um, Elena is in the audience. Do you want Elena brought in? Yeah, that would be very nice. Thank you. Because Elena has worked on this too. So I have, Elena should be able to join us now. Hello. Hello. Welcome, Elena. Um, 
Okay, so Shalini and Elena, do you want to talk about the changes you've made? And then we'll do the similar thing that we just did when we're reviewing stuff. So we'll do the similar thing we just did with the rental bylaw draft with your draft. And if we can get through it, mm -hmm. hopefully we can vote. Okay, uh, so first I just want to thank everyone. There were at least three or four, four counselors who provided feedback. And um, there's still some pending questions, which I'm hoping I will be able to clarify, but I did try to um, address uh, all of the concerns. And again, I think um, this is a new thing we're trying to do, which is really have a very um, involved process or an intentional process around community engagement. And so it's still a work in progress and we've learned a lot, I think, in this process. The one learning I want to state up front is that um, two learnings. One, I, uh, which I will share is the benefits of collecting quantitative data through survey questions, which we did. And the quantitative data was uh, around rating. So you give a number of items to the different um, stakeholders and we ask them to rate their satisfaction um from highly satisfied to highly dissatisfied and there is benefit in that because you get quantitative numbers which is on page 15 we can see um what people rated their satisfaction dissatisfaction on um but then we also asked open-ended questions and there is value in that uh, which we asked in terms of trying to understand people people's lived experiences in Amherst, which was just left open. What do you love about living here? What are your challenges? What would you like to cha see changed? And we, I just want to give one example of the value of asking an open ended question is that on page 15, where we have asked the quantitative data and energy efficiency was rated as one of the top five issues of concern for tenants. And in the, so that's on page 15, I believe. And so about 35% of the tenants rated that energy efficiency as being dissatisfying, dissatisfied, or yeah, I think it's the next page over. Yeah, that one. So, um, yeah, it really. Conan. But anyway, so 35% of the people, tenants, reported energy efficiency being dissatisfied with that or highly dissatisfied. But in the open-ended questions, when we asked people about their challenges, what would they like to see, there were very few um, mentions about energy efficiency. So that you can kind of see the value of, the, and on the flip side, we did not ask about occupancy limits. We did not ask about noise or uh, certain other things like um, we didn't ask about uh, housing shortage or occupancy limits, issues of noise, uh, complaint process for tenants. But those are issues that came up from the data, from the people without any kind of prompting and them saying that there were these issues. So I just want you all to have a sense that there is this, there is a, benefit of having some quantifiable data and some open ended data. Now the open ended data, how do we draw inference from it or how do we draw value from it? So which is where that process of uh, tagging comes in and it's inductive process, which means we're not coming in with a priori ideas, only looking for what was on a survey item. We were tagging each word so there were 1,000 pieces of responses. Um, and so we look at each item, each response, and say, OK, if they talked about cost, that's tagged as cost. If they said occupancy limit, we called it a four tenant. If it was noise, we tagged it as noise, uh, trash. So we kind of do that. Now, there is human error, which I know there were two, and I've corrected them. So here is where the second learning comes in, that it's really good, even though I had Elena uh, working with me on this. It's, generally you want a rater or inter-rater reliability. So it's generally good for two people. So I would say in the future, maybe two counselors need to look into it along with Elena to kind of get that lens that are we coding it in you know, the true spirit of what is being said. 
So, so we code the different things and that's how we came up with the different main qualitatively, um, the issues that came from the qualitative data were related to cost, about the quality of housing, which we knew, the noise-related issues were really large uh, for residents. Um, and within each of them, there are some, we tried to look at each issue from the perspective of the tenant, the neighbors, and the landlords. And the hope for that is that we create more sensitivity in at home for, you know, for each other's perspectives. Um, so within each of them, I'm, I'm hoping that all of us can take away, including staff will take away some things, but the landlords can look at some of the things like, for example, related to noise. It was very clear that often tenants or even neighbors don't know about the noise bylaw. Like they don't, either they don't know that it exists, or even if they did know, they didn't know what the timing was. So they were asking for the police to come in at nine o'clock, for instance, because there was a part, you know, there was someone playing music in the house and it was too loud. So those are kind of things that are, it seems like education, letting people know what are the bylaws in a town seems to be like a very important issue uh, that's coming up. Um, and other than that, I think I could go into maybe look at if it's helpful. We could start from just quickly go over the quantitative data, go over the themes and the qualitative data, and then uh, and then we can go into the executive summary because I think the important thing is to first agree that this is what we are hearing and learning from our constituents, which is the last part of the report. And then we can see like, if you're agreeing that these are the issues coming up, then how do we use that information? How do different people, like mainly I tried to look at it from the rental, that's the executive report is what we've heard from tenants, landlords, and neighbors, how can that inform or at least keep that in mind as we're looking at the rental registration, which I think we're looking at a lot of the things, but it's nice to have that you know, as a record. So I don't know, Mandy Jay, or if everyone, if that's helpful to start with some of the issues that came up in the qualitative data. So that would be under. So you want to start at page 13, how we analyzed the data? Let me or see. The background. Um, let's go forward. Uh, Bill, uh, we would go to how we analyze the data. Okay, so we're going to start at background and we'll do background down and then we'll yeah, come yeah. back to the first 10 pages. Um, but yeah. we'll, start, we'll do the yeah. last 20 or so and then come right. back to the first 10. Right. Um, so background, I'm going to um, make it a little smaller so I can potentially get most of the page on. Right. Um, everyone has a copy of this. It's in the packet so um yeah. are there background is just one page are there any requested changes to the background section mm -hmm. Oops. no so i think should we go to the next page yep um okay so because here there were a couple of things that um did come up and i think we can decide what to do with that so one is um when we look at the especially for overarching theme the image the picture there overarching themes for year-round residents and the four tenant rule is mentioned over there and for the resident for the neighbors it was the an enforcement or the lack of enforcement of the four tenant rule. So I'm wondering if that would make more sense rather than just saying four tenant rule. Uh, Jennifer. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, but Mandy Joe, what do you think? I, I would push back on that. Um, parking is in both. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, 
you know, if, if you look at some of these, I think what you tried to do, Shalini, is match the language in each. Right. Um, and so if you put a, you know, if you put, um, if you change the wording in the four tenant rule up in the sort of the neighbors to rental property section, and you don't change it down here, you're <coughs> implying different things potentially. And, and so, you know, I've always pictured trying to keep the language as consistent as possible. Um, so, you know, I, and, and I'm, I'm trying to breeze through some of this to see if there's other places that have similar things, but the language is not the same. Um, and I think the other thing can add to that, Mandy Jo. Yeah. Is that, you know, when we think of parking, um, they want parking, but it's the lack of parking or lack of enforcement around parking. So most of these issues in the year-round residents were around the lack of enforcement of these issues around noise bylaw or parking or trash. I mean, all of these bylaws already exist. And I think most of the issues, including the 410, and all of these rules and bylaws exist but a lot of the complaints were coming because of the lack of enforcement of all of them. So unless we change the language around all of them and say lack of enforcement of the noise bylaw and lack of enforcement of parking. So, yeah. Um, Jennifer, you... then Pam. Um, okay, two things. I It could say four tenant rule enforcement. I think it has to be there because parking I really struck me as being different. And Parking was one of those items that that seemed to be one of the greatest concerns among all constituencies. So the residents, the tenants were saying they didn't have enough parking. The neighbors were saying there's too many cars parked everywhere. And what I thought was interesting, but valid, is that the landlords of, you know, sort of the house, the houses or duplexes or triplexes that weren't downtown we're saying, why do we have to provide parking when One East Pleasant didn't have to provide parking? So parking seemed to be much more, not just enforcement, but just the whole concept of, of parking and how it impacts the different stakeholders. And I, unless it says four tenant rule enforcement, I actually wouldn't be able to, it would be very problematic for me to approve the report because I think anything that's saying that that rule is problematic that i don't i that was not the takeaway for me from reading all those surveys so i do see it as being different than parking pam yeah i would i would say exactly the same thing so then i would say we need to change the tenant responses because then you'd have to say the four tenant rule is not an accurate description of what the tenants were saying um, they want a different rule. They don't want it enforced, right? They that that any additional enforcement and just the presence of that rule is a problem for them, and they just define that. And I so wouldn't mind if would you took it out altogether. The tenant, no, I, I wouldn't take it out of the tenant responses. I'm just saying it needs rephrased. No, no, but you could take it out of the qualitative analysis, quantitative analysis. Uh, wait, can we hear from Elena? She's yes. Elena. Yeah. Um, if we're speaking exclusively about the image on the right, just the graphs, I think it's just mainly touching on the presence of those themes in all of the data rather than the implication of those words. Because I agree if we change, if we add enforcement, which I think would be helpful for the context of the year-round residents, we would probably also have to change parking as well because it depends on how you view Mm. what it is um, the theme is talking about or what it is that the theme will be. I think it's mainly just talk, the presence of the words on those um, visuals are just about the presence of the theme in the data that we found. Jennifer? Yeah, see, I find that, I guess, <laughs> it's problematic that just, um, you know, when I read the tenant surveys there, I believe there were like, Eight out of the eight. Ten out of seventy-seven. 
Right. And there were like 39 on the 10. I mean, it gets very. But, uh, yes, it is an issue. Right. I, I just, I find that's why I am uncomfortable with this report. And you know that I think it's things are, you know, if somebody said something once while well, it's valid, I mean, of course, the, of course, the students want to be able to live with as many people as they can. I mean, that doesn't even, that would go without saying, I would want that too, if I was, you know, 19 and going to college, but I don't think that what came out of the report was that we need to, that this is problematic just because everybody doesn't. And I think it's presence there, somebody two years from now, we're not in the room, they're gonna look at this and say, oh, this is four tenant, you know, rule or is mm -hmm. problematic. And I just, um, maybe we should, it, it, it's there to raise a question about something that I don't think was borne out in enough of the survey responses that it rise, that it, you know, I, I think if something said a hundred times and something says once, and I'm not saying that, I'm just throwing that as an example, that's not, that's problematic if it is, appears equally in the report. Okay, can I respond to that? Because I think there, you know, this is raising a lot of issues and I think there's, just to move forward with it, um, let's make the, let's see if we can make it parallel in that sense with respect, because as Elena was saying, we were just pointing the theme, but as Jennifer also said, if someone outside reads a report and they just see this, they're gonna draw their own conclusions about it, that, oh, the four tenant rule is a bad idea. So that's not what, the residents were saying because what they were saying is it's the unenforcement of it that's a problem and if that makes it clearer for everyone let's just do that that's what i would say and uh, i think in terms of again what is important and not important like 12 and a half percent of the um tenants raised it without being asked about it and more than and, and i think uh pam sent me you know she said there were like 30 uh, yeah. That was 30% of the residents raised the unenforcement of it as an issue. And uh, Pam added the question, which I've included, is why is it not being enforced? So there is all, and the, in, the, in the executive summary, the conclusion we're drawing from this is that a further discussion is needed, as Pam also added, why is this not being enforced? So we need a further discussion around uh, what is the enforcement? How are we enforcing it? Why is it not being enforced? And you know, all I'm, so all I'm saying is that it means it's not saying we should change the rule. It's just saying further discussion is needed to address the concerns um, that came up, or maybe not even address, but to at least talk about the concerns that came out of this. Does that sound, Pam? Um, Pam, and then John. Um, so I had a question about um, actually what, what constituted a theme. Mm -hmm. So was it, you know, was it the seven people that said yeah. we want to be able to live with our with our girlfriend or or friends? They are able now to live with their girlfriends or friends. There is nothing stopping them that has anything to do with the four person rule that is allowing them to live with their girlfriends or friends. They just have to find a place together where the four of them can live legally. Um, so again, um, so I don't know really what, how much, how many tick constitutes a theme. It didn't seem like a theme for, um, for the, uh, tenants. I think anything about, I mean, that's again for a committee to decide for us, if it came up more than five or seven times we included, but in specifically with respect to tenants, it was 12 and a half percent of the tenants raise it so it's above 10 percent of the people talking about it so it be, it's not again saying that we again i'm not saying because the uh, tenants are asking that we should broaden it that's what we should do but because that's what the tenants are saying but all it's saying is that these are questions in people's minds that why is it there so maybe it requires education and the neighbors are like why is this not being enforced why do i have 12 cars outside so it is something we need to discuss uh, and I'm okay with, you know, adding the unenforced and um, John. Yes, John. Just a quick question about um, how many responses were there? 
So there were 77, I mean, this is when, okay, and that's another disclaimer that, okay, this data is analyzing 77 tenants who responded and I think 97 or 98 residents who responded. Oh, phew, man, I was having a heart attack there. Okay, 100 people. So 250 total responses at the time this was drafted. The, the final number of responses before we closed the survey um, Thanks. was 278 responses. Because it's, not, it's okay. not correct that it's not being enforced. It's being enforced. Maybe it's not, maybe you don't like that it's not being enforced as often as you'd like, but it's being enforced. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. Yeah. Jennifer, and then we're going to move on to the next page because this seems to be the only comment on this page. Yeah, no, I was um yeah, there were, you know, is I don't know if it's enforcement, I guess it is, you know, a lot of the neighbors, you know, or certain maybe 39 out of the 278, I don't know what the exact number of surveys, I think it was 39, said that they were, it was problematic for them that there were more than four students living next door or whatever. Yeah, because you can only enforce what's reported to you or go out and check on. Um, yeah, so that's how, I, so so it's it's feeling, I think, to the neighbors that it's not being enforced, but it's a very hard one to enforce but it's very important to the neighbors that it be enforced. Um, yeah. Thank you. Just to, again, just wrap up this part, is it for rule on, like what was the language we agreed on? For rule on and we, we haven't um, unenforced. agreed on full language for either of them. Um, the request for under the neighbors was for tenant rule enforcement um, there was a problem yeah. with figuring out what you could change in the tenant graphic to accurately reflect what the tenants were, what their themes were regarding that rule, um, because it's harder to change that graphic and language to convey a similar phrasing and theme that the change in the neighbor responses would convey for tenant limit that's that's what they don't want yeah limit mm -hmm. for yeah let's just make that for tenant limit for that's what they don't want um for different reasons for tenant limit for tenants and then for neighbors pam you wanted to say something pam um, I, I would agree with that, but then and for, for year round, it's for tenant rule on enforcement. An enforcement. Yeah. And, uh, and John, no, no, no offense, but that is that is all that we hear is that is that there appear to be too many people living next door to me um, because there are always six cars. Yes, yeah. But we know that they are not they're not being held, it's, it's not your fault, they're not being held to um, the, the rules. Hmm. Yeah. Moving on. Okay, one other thing which I actually noticed is, which I think we should remove, is the one under landlord themes and it says preferential treatment and there was actually only one person who said that they felt that they were not being you know, that they were being discriminated against. It was just, I've been through again, uh, unfair, preferential, dis, you know, discrimination, and I didn't find anyone else other than that one. So maybe that's one we do need to remove. Because that's not a high enough percentage. Yeah, like they should be at least five people or at least 10%. I mean, in the future, we can come up with these uh, numbers moving forward. Um, but I think for now, it's safe to say that only one person said it, and I don't think we can add it as a comment, but not remove it from the main theme. Okay, on to what we heard qualitative analysis. Um, I'm going to page through slowly, but mm -hmm. all section one, section two, a lot of this is um, 
graphics without a lot of wording. Um, so if there's if there's anything on page 14, 15, 16, um, raise your hand. I think just a point of interest is that 80% of the 88% of the tenants is more for the staff, I think maybe that 88% of the tenants knew who to contact in case of maintenance, but the neighbors don't know if they have a problem. 45% of them said they know, knew who to contact in case of building or safety code violations. So I thought that was interesting. Pam and Jennifer, pages 14, 15, and 16. Yeah, this is on Q23. Uh, please rate your dissatisfaction for the following items. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't think um, the noise was, was not included, so there was no way to mm -hmm. voice yeah. concern about noise. Mm -hmm. Right. We can't change that. That was an error in the question. Yeah, but it's not even it's not even an error, Manager, because the way we drew the yes. questions was based on the criteria that were related to the rental registration. And that's why we have open ended questions is that in case as a surveyor, we did not anticipate this is a big thing, then it shows up later on. And that's one of the questions that uh, the counselors has raised was why are there more items in the for the tenants versus if you look at there are more items i think 13 and they're only eight or whatever something right. like that items for neighbors and that's because some of the issues that we asked about were pertaining to more um we tried to keep the survey questions identical for all the three uh constituents uh stakeholders but like uh energy efficiency of a home or internal, let's say, uh, security in the building or access to maintenance of the building. These are more related to tenant questions. So that's why they didn't feature on the- On the neighbor, neighbor. side. Pam and Jennifer. That's it. That was my question. Why not include it? <clears throat> Jennifer. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know how I missed on page that we already went behind the page seven. So I don't know. We didn't to start there. We started at eleven. Okay, so we'll, we'll go come back. back to one to ten. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're trying to get through eleven down to thirty-four yeah. first. Okay. And that's because this is you more. Of a, yeah, and the reason for doing that, Jennifer, is because we're just first coming to an agreement that the data that we collected, right. the analysis we did, we're all on the same page. Okay. That's so fine. now qualitative analysis. Um, there are eight sections. Um, I will, we can see all eight sections here, but in terms of what the sections are, it is the next 17 pages of documents. So um, are there any requested concerns or changes or revisions to section one stakeholder perspectives on costs? It's multiple pages and mostly quotes. So the only thing I would have is, I, I just had a couple of formatting things, which is, um, you know, a space here, a couple of things there on some of these additional quotes, and then they're missing quotes. So it wasn't clear whether they were actual quotes from the survey. Yes. So just going through and fixing <laughs> all of that and some, some font issues and stuff that showed up in a lot of the quotes that were added and all. I know word can be crazy. Um, yeah. So. And it was like also because of so many, yeah, the spacing and font yeah. and size can all be cleaned up once we agree. So um, anything with, if no, nothing else with cost, uh, housing and maintenance, number two. Well, while we're going through these, I think I had some thoughts about about the um, the manner, the 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 final uh, portrayal of the key insights in the questions, and mm -hmm. the, um, there was some there was some liberty taken in in formulating the key insights because sometimes they were simply not insights; they were simply a comment that somebody made, which is very different than a real insight. Do you have any requested changes to them for either cost or quality of housing and maintenance? Um, I'm trying to figure out what page my notes are, and it's probably, uh, it's on the first section, one through 
10 or something like that. Okay, so not on these pages. They don't appear to be. Okay, section three, noise related issues. Hmm. Seeing no hands. Section um, and hopefully four. Like, this will hopefully be used when we do the nuisance bylaws and stuff. I think you know a lot of these questions are, you know, who's accountable, who's responsible, and things like that. So yeah. this is I'm just gonna point out this is one where the sizing doesn't match across the three. One, there's a bunch of them on the landlord one that got bigger for some weird reason. Um, so just go through and check them. Parking. Requested changes under parking. Okay, so hold on, hold on back, back to key insights, page 21. Key insights, questions pertaining to noise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how the, I, I'm just going to say it again. It's just generally how do, how do the, specific questions um, get get formulated, one through five. Oh, the questions? Yeah. I mean, this is like I started us off, but if anyone wants to read like what they saw, and this isn't based on the what people were saying, I tried to pull out questions. This is totally we can remove them if anyone doesn't agree and we can add to them like the idea is not just that we collect the data It's like what do we do with that data what does it make us think and how do we use that information you know like so in terms of noise the landlords were saying just charge the tenants three hundred dollars and they will never make noise again whereas you know the tenants were saying something else like or you know it's, it's they were like well we're doing it but the neighbors don't know and then the neighbors all that you know so everyone had their own perspective so how do we use these different perspectives to inform the nuisance bylaw that we are going to be writing so that's the that was the intent behind the questions but i'm totally okay with like that was the other thing ways to make quiet hours known to tenants and neighbors because that seemed like many people did not know about the noise bylaw. Even the tenants, many of them don't know. Any oh, requested changes? No. But as you'll go through it, please feel free to send me questions because we can add them. I can definitely add more questions that are coming to your mind related to what we discovered. Parking, which was section four. I've paged through because we were almost on that. Any requested changes? Say none, Proce complaint process and fine. Any requested changes? And in terms of parking, and I just point out because that keeps coming up, people have that perception that the downtown buildings are getting a preference over. So I think just letting everyone know there's parking requirements based on the different zoning is different. So it's not that they're being treated preferentially, it's just that it's in the downtown. The right, but, but there's, yeah, but, but it's still true. I mean, I'm not even advocating, I'm just saying if somebody in- It's the I, law, yeah. Right. No, but I think they need to know that this is the, it's not like they're- so The yeah. law preferences, not right. the they individual- They still feel right. It, it's not a- board or committee or the staff preferencing, it's the law we've written, which yeah, is the difference. <laughs> and which is why I had that question, do we need to revisit the parking requirements in the do I think so, yes. <laughs> or, or clarify them in the lease. No, probably but, revisit. <laughs> complaint like process and fines, any requested changes. You can see the theme over here, like when I'm seeing these issues, it's like just saying that, like, do we need to have a discussion around this? Do we need to look at it? That's what's happening here. Which one is this? This is complaint process and fines. Yeah, this one is. I've basically just been paging down to the key insight and questions and holding there as, as yeah, right. I look to see if anyone has any changes. And if not, I'll move on to the next set. Yeah, this was a big one for tenants, right? Elena, I don't know if you want to. 
add anything to the complaint? Do the tenants generally, or at least student tenants, do they know what the complaint process is, who to complain to, and anything? Um, from the data, we were just finding that a lot of, or from responses I was reading, that a lot of people, when they wanted to complain, weren't sure where to go or were um, upset that they didn't know like the landlord's names and didn't have enough communication between um, either law enforcement, the landlords, and the neighbors or residents nearby. Any requested changes? Relationship oh. between tenants, neighbors, and landlords. Yes, Shalini. One last thing is uh, that's for this, uh, for maybe um, John. Are landlords informed when police is called to their properties, or if the land? Because I heard one of them said that if the landlord hears noise or sees some violation, I think it was for noise, they are not allowed to notify because they're not a party that's impacted, you have to be a neighbor to make a, a noise violation call, and then they feel that they're going to be uh, affected because it's their property. But on the other hand, they cannot complain about the noise. John? do So is the question, do the landlords know if there's a noise complaint? No. So two things. One is, can a landlord complain about a noise violation in their property, even though they're not a neighbor to that property? No, they can't. Right, so that was kind of what uh, neighbors complain. And then are landlords informed when police is called to their properties? Yes, so every Monday, um, Officer Laramie um, uh, rounds up the noise complaints for the weekend and sends it to all the landlords. There's a mass email that goes out. Okay. Great. Any requested changes to the relationship between tenants, neighbors, and landlords? Pam. No, I just thought I'd do at some point, not right now, come back to John about why why someone who is and may be physically fiscally and physically responsible for some of these violations not be able to, to file a complaint themselves. And I just want to I'll come back to it another time. Right. That's why that question is there. All right. Next one was the. Um, Any requested changes to relationship between tenants, neighbors, and landlords? In, interestingly, in the survey, the quantitative data, both resident, neighbors, and tenants rated their relationship with, um, with the neighbors and tenants as an important one, and that it was dissatisfactory. So I don't know what we can do, what the staff can do, or but just putting it out into the universe <laughs> that if um, you know there are some cases where residents really make the tenants feel welcome. There's a brownie week and whatnot, and in some cases the tenants are really respectful. They help the elders in the neighborhood, and everything is great. And in other cases, you know, it's just the opposite. So how can we replicate what is working well into other neighborhoods? Any requested changes on the perspectives regarding the occupancy limit and zoning, other zoning issues? I think just this is where there's, there's like font issues and size issues and stuff like that. Too. And Jennifer, you had a question about transparency, like how to promote more transparency from brokers and real estate agents related to neighborhoods that residents are moving. Should I remove that? Does that make sense, that question? Yeah, I think, I know that came from one. I'm just, you know, I told you my concern. Yes, I think that, you know, um, that realtors have, um, you know, a responsibility, you know, to be clear with a client, you know, what some of the concerns in the neighborhoods are, but I was just afraid that with that, it could be, could be interpreted as a form of redlining where it's like, beware of buying in a neighborhood where there's a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. you know what, where there's a lot of student rentals. I think that that's, that, that could be problematic. So we can remove that. Yeah. Mm. And I think it was only in one survey that that was expressed. Right. Okay, remove that, delete. Occupancy limits, any requested changes to that? This one had a lot of changes from the yes. last one. Um, let me just, can I pee? No, wait a minute, excuse me, let's go back. I think uh, you highlighted the wrong one, Mandy. 
it should be it should be number two. Oh, that number two, sorry. Thanks for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. You're doing it there. Okay, good. Um, stakeholder, and then wait, wait. Okay, so one counselor sent me that they don't like the word for tenant and wanted it to be occupancy. Is that I just put both? Is that something? I mean, I don't see the two as different. But a counselor who's not in this committee was concerned and they said, no, 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 it shouldn't be for tenant. It's about occupancy. But in this committee, do we see that as, yeah, Pam? I prefer for occupant because, because they could, and we know they do only put four people on the lease, uh -huh. but there are more occupants than tenants. So even occupants not quite correct because we don't have a strict four occupant limit. It's, it's, four, it, it's, it's unrelated. The it's a four unrelated individual limit right. in the um, non-occupant. Non and can I just add, it, it's actually four non-related individuals in a non-owner occupied dwelling. Because if it's owner occupied, it doesn't. No, I, I think it doesn't matter whether it's owner occupied or not. If there are four unrelated individuals. No, I, no because you could be John, a family of eight people, oh, but then you're related. So you're yeah. related, John. Does it matter? I was I was just gonna say in the sanitary code, um, it's always occupants. It, it only talks about occupants. That they never use the word tenants. So that's just from you right. know mass general. But law. John, is it true that if it's owner occupied, you don't have the four non-related? Like if if I'm living if in my owner, house, if you're living in your house and you want to rent three bedrooms, you can do that. But could I rent the three bedrooms to six people? No. No, even if it's owner occupied, really? Yeah. No. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a four unrelated individual. It's in our definitions of the zoning bylaw. Go read the definition of I will. I honestly bylaw. thought it didn't apply to owner occupied. It, okay. It applies. It okay. applies to all residential okay. buildings. So okay. so maybe we change that wording to um for unrelated it's gonna be so long occupant. okay occupant can we just say occupant and then define what we mean by that yeah yeah no because you have to talk about unrelated because it's not an occupant limit it's an unrelated occupant limit right jennifer and have, Pam? you could have six kids and yeah Pam? yes <laughs> um, in this case, I think we're it's it's shorthand for what we're talking about, and I think at the very beginning, where it's introduced for the first time, we talk about four unrelated occupants. Mm -hmm. But I think here it's just a title, and so I don't think we need to be as as quite as concerned with this kind of just. Thank you. Yeah. Older, Thank you. Older. Okay. Any other requested changes? Yes, <laughs> I have, I'm not comfortable because I don't think it's really necessarily accurate. It is also noted as discriminatory against students. I don't think that's phrased. Oh, okay. We can change that. It is also noted as, oh, that's because uh, I think. Well, I know you're saying that sometimes they don't want to complain if they have more people oh, living also, there. But I don't, that would apply to any occupancy. And I don't think we're gonna get, you know, any occupancy limit. Could it? So, yeah, I, I, I would have to go back and see where that language came from. But um, I think the history of the reason there is a four unrelated occupant definition in the bylaw is directly directed towards the fact that we are a college town that most towns don't even consider occupancy limits. I could be wrong on that. Um, and so if it really is a product of our um, demographics of being a college town, then it could be noted as discriminatory against students. But I think we need to figure out where that language came from before we decide whether to keep- Yeah, so I would push that. back against saying it's discriminatory against students to have a limit, an occupancy limit. Most towns- I mean, that's a very a loaded um, statement. <laughs> oh, thank you, John. Most towns do? Yes. Okay. Of unrelated? 
Um, I, yeah, and it, and and when I started working at this job, I I you know did a little bit of research on that, and it's and it goes it's three, it's four, it's five, but it, it, it's it's in that range. So we could maybe eliminate this phrase and say it is also noted. It is also used by landlords. But is it okay? I mean, is or it, it was is, noted that it is used by landlords. Uh, that's yeah. true, though. I mean, it may be happening, but are landlords literally intending that? So landlords are okay. They are telling the tenants that go ahead and complain, you'll get kicked out. Mm -hmm. But there, so the landlords are letting them have more than four. So and then when the there's an issue is, with health and safety, they're then saying, well, fine, complain, but you might get kicked out of your house. Okay, so that's where we need to enforce the occupancy limit. So it's like the onus isn't, this is suggesting that the onus is on the town to get rid of the limits because it's create, you know, this is happening. No, this is why we have to really in, enforce it so that this doesn't happen. Okay, so um, can I just say from where it's coming? The sense yeah. of two different reasons. One was where we just talked about where tenants can't complain and the landlords are using it. The second one is a direct quote down there, the lack of ability to have more. Um, if I want to live with more, I should be able to do this a discriminatory of college students preventing we would to, and it's basically where they were saying that if they're not, um, they can't live with people that they want to live. But they can, they just can't live with an indefinite number. Hmm. I mean, nobody's saying you can't live with a friend or you can't live with your partner. They're just saying you can you can live with three friends and partners in addition to yourself. But if the part, like in the sense, if there are four paying people and they're not, they don't want, like they need, like they're already a partnership, then that's one group and they need more rent from three other people. So then you're saying we can count one of the partners as one of the tenants. Right. I mean, you can live with your yeah, but I, significant I, other and two so, other roommates. Well, so I, I think what they're saying, but but we don't want to get into the, no, we don't have to get into the challenge, but I think what they're saying is line. if it's a four bedroom house, and there is a couple that want to occupy one of those bedrooms, this limit does not allow them to actually fill the other three bedrooms. That's oh. correct. Yeah. That, and I think that's what that comment was relating right. to of it doesn't allow them to do that because they can't actually rent mm -hmm. all bedrooms if two people are right, going to Because we're saying you can only have four people, but you have four people splitting the rent, even if mm -hmm. right. there's a couple. But then you've got a room empty. Um, you, so you do. Any, question, any other changes to this? Section? So how will that, so I would ask, this may be jumping ahead, that we come back, I know we want to finish it today with a final clean copy so we know what we would be voting on. We're going to try and get through the next three pages and then we will come back, we'll get Shalini to adjust those pages and then we'll still have to do one to 10. Okay, but okay. We won't retouch on these because we'll have been through these. But we'll get to see the final, what it looks like. Yes, yeah, it will be in a future agenda and a future packet, okay. the fixed 11 to 34 we'll have to still do one to 10. Since we've seen these, I would say just accept the changes in one to 10 because people know where their concerns are. We don't need to see the track change version in that mm -hmm. um, just to make it easier to read. Right, um, and it's to clean up that way too. But we'll we'll clean it up that way, but we'll still still have to review pages one to 10. Yes, <laughs> before yes, we- That I won't we touch, yeah. but this I'll accept. So these, I'm trying to get through the next three pages. Any other requested changes to the perspectives that arose, section eight? Oh, and I was just gonna make that note in the climate change and environment that in the survey data, 35% it was in the top five concerns, the energy efficiency, but in the survey, just highlight that, but in the survey, uh, not, it, you know, very few concerns were raised, including these. Okay. Um, and that was the other counselor who was not in the committee said like, why do you have this? Because there were not many people who mentioned it. But I think because we are trying to get that lens, it was important to raise, put it there. And then even the social and racial equity, there weren't many, um, there were not many responses. 
but which also is telling us something that maybe we need to do a better job next time to ensure that we're getting more diversity uh, in our response. And, and potentially, and asking questions related to these issues too. Thank you. you, know, we, you we, didn't, <laughs> we didn't ask the questions. So Pam, any other questions? Well, that was the other requests. We didn't, we didn't ask the right questions. Okay. Right, right. Um, 34 is empty. I think that's for a reason. Um, I, I would request that the next draft that come up give the appendix that I think you refer to in the first part, attach the appendix, or or if it's a separate document, you know, that's okay, but we should be able to see it. I think it's referred to somewhere in here. That's why I'm asking. Oh, the appendix. Um, yeah, I think I'll put it down at the bottom, but actually all of those things are a hyperlink. That is the appendix. <laughs> I'll put it down again. Okay, just make sure the hyperlinks are there and somewhere in the document if that's the appendix. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so um, I we're going to stop this. We still have pages one to 10 to do. Um, we'll come back with that on a separate agenda at some other point and then hopefully be able to get to a vote. Um, in the meantime, we've finished our review of everything past the table of contents. <laughs> so it's the first sections before you hit pay table of contents that we're going to have to mm -hmm. review at a future meeting. Um, I will ship the notes I took off to you, Shalini, so that you can see those notes from that. Um, yeah. And with that, um, we're going to move on to, uh, I believe we are on general public comment, uh, public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC. Um, up to three minutes. If you're interested, please raise your hand. Um, we have one hand raised. Um, Dorothy Pam, please um, unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can. Yeah. I just wanted to comment that I thought that um, owner adjacent is not the same as owner occupied. Um, owner occupied means that if there's a smell in the house um, of uh, you know, bad cooking odors or mold or mildew, um, if there's a tenant who is behaving strangely and bizarrely, uh, if there's noise things, only the people who live in the house are really aware of that. Somebody who lives next door doesn't, uh, you know, unless the houses are wall to wall and poorly constructed. So I, I do think that there's, I, I understand that an, an owner living nearby is some kind of protection, but it's not the same thing as owner occupied. That's it. Thank you for your comments, Dorothy. Um, with that, there are no other hands. We are going to close the public comment period. Um, Minutes. Um, are there any requested changes to the January 26th meeting minutes? Sorry, Mandy Jo, we have Elena here. And oh, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> Elena, thank you. Want you to join us for minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Elena, thank you for your time. Um, Shalini, we'll keep you updated when we next have it on the agenda. It could be a little bit. Um, I want to thank John and Rob for their time today, too. Um, we have a listening session on Monday. Um, I don't expect John and Rob to come unless you want to. Um, <laughs> or Dave. Um, our next meeting is next Thursday. And right now, um, the plan is an introduction to um, Pat and I's zoning proposal. Um, and the other half of it would be returning to the nuisance prop, the public nuisance bylaw for another look. Um, uh, we, when we get to future agenda items, we can talk about that plan and see if there's anything we'd like to change with that plan based on what we got to today. It's why that agenda is not posted yet. Um, um, so thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to do minutes and then we're going to talk about the next agenda and all. Um, so minutes, are there any requested changes to the January 26th meeting minutes? Seeing none, I'm going to make the motion to approve the January 26th meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. We'll give that to Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, Pam can have yeah. it. <laughs> um, any comments before we vote? Seeing none, we're going to vote. Shalini? Yes. Uh, Mandy is an aye. Pam? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Uh, that, okay. They are adopted unanimously with one absent um and thanks and thanks to kelly miller for formulating them yes yeah. 
been doing an excellent job. I don't have any announcements that aren't attached to agendas. So um, if they, so they, they kind of blend for me. Um, so Jennifer. No, I'm just wondering if there's anything particular we do to prepare for Monday or just we'll be listening and asking questions. So let me let me go through what um, Pam and I have. Our our next meeting is a special meeting. It's on Monday. It's the listening session. Um, Pam and I have sort of garnered a four part process. I would say we're not sure we'll get to the fourth part. We'll see. Pam's looking to be like four. I'm counting nuisance bylaws part four. <laughs> and she's like, where's part four? And um, so. We have invited um, a variety of landlords that own a variety of numbers of dwelling units um, to, par to participate in sort of a conversation with us. And so we've split that into sort of the number of dwelling units that might be owned or managed. And what we've done is ask them to contact us if they would like to be participants as panelists for portions of this listening session. And so we will start the listening session with those that want to participate in such a conversation that own or manage 15 or more dwelling units. And then after approximately a half an hour or so, we will, we're, we're gonna wait to see how many people are interested in this before we fully set these time limits. Then we will move on to those landlords that have expressed interest in property owners that manage or own less than 15 dwelling units across the town and do the same thing with them, recognizing that those that own more may have different concerns with the bylaw than those that own less. Um, after that, we will move to what I'm calling the community listening session. Anyone else, um, that's when we'll do sort of the listening session as we've done in the past, hopefully focused on the wording of the bylaw and regulations where people are concerned about the specific language that we've got. Um, because we're inviting people in to be panelists for that first session, we will preference anyone who was not a panelist for that first session and came in to sort of have that conversation in this in that listening session, the people who were in the audience for that basically and preference them for their comments. If there are time, we will allow those that participated in that two sets of conversations to make more comments. Um, if there is time after that, we're going to go to the public nuisance bylaw um, and we're going to treat that portion of it if there is time as sort of the first listening session that we did similar to the first listening session we did for this residential rental. Hey, what are your concerns? What are this to get a general idea to hopefully inform our next conversations regarding the nuisance bylaw. No specifics or you know, we're not concentrating on what what the language is or the redrafted language, but more of a what would you want to see out of one? What problems do you see with it right now? That sort of thing. Think back to our first listening session on residential permitting. So that's the plan. Um, I'm tentatively planning three hours. Um, so if we, in, in terms of trying to get everyone in, we'll take our measure at like two, two and a half, depending on where we are. I don't know how long it will be. We've thought about a half an hour for each of the first two parts of conversation and then an hour for the rest of it. We'll see how we're feeling. Um, the one that will get dropped is the nuisance part. If, we, <laughs> if we're running and everything is long, that's what we'll drop because we have plenty of time to deal with that one later um so you may have another session at some future we may end up with another one in march or something dealing with public nuisance yeah um but trying to use these in theory the same people might be interested let's try and get as much out of these as we can so that's the plan any questions with that pam um just a comment to dave while you're still here um that um the notice for the the listening session went to Steve McCarthy and Rob and John Thompson, I think John Thompson, and just to let them know to, to send that out to the list of owners, renters, our owners, managers, so that they are aware of it. I, I targeted a few that I am aware of that I have addresses for, um, but it clearly is not the whole list. So thanks. Sure, happy to do that. Did I understand from Mandy's earlier comment though that you specifically invited? So, so there was a request. Was there outreach from, other than in an email? Were there calls made or? No, there were um, the emails that Pam sent. Um, this this 
process and this plan evolved after a request from a committee member to um, have the committee have a conversations with Cayman's Realty, Pat Cayman's and Tom Crossman and, and have it as a committee one. And I thought a listening session would be the appropriate one. Um, Pam and I talked about how we could do this and make it more fair. And so that's sort of where it started, which is why I said specific outreach to some. Pam this morning sent some emails directly to a number of landlords that she's aware of. And then we're hoping that um, with a request to sort of the Rob, I think you were on that email, Dave, to maybe get was, that forwarded yeah. to the permit list um, would be great um, to see if if we can get more. I happen to be at the Chamber of Commerce breakfast this morning on another issue. And so there were a number of property managers there. And so I mentioned it there too, um, because I happened to be there. <laughs> So um, we're we're trying. We've we've. I will send out this. I think Pam, did you send it to the whole council? Or I think I didn't. I will I send it out to the council to see if we can get them to spread the word too on this. It is on the Engage Amherst webpage too. Um, so we're we're trying. It's a little last minute because we didn't settle on this until Tuesday night. I think is when we settled, and we've been working on language and all. Jennifer, I was just gonna say I sent it to my district mailing list last night. So. Excellent. Um, okay, and I'll send out the language we've been using to the whole council so that everyone can can forward that to people. Um, what we're asking is that either Pam or I, or preferably both, be notified if a person wants to be part of that first set of conversations, because we will be transferring people from the attendees into that and we need to know numbers in order to estimate the amount of time they will have to converse with us as committee members. That conversation will start with them saying their concerns and then we can ask some questions of specific related to those concerns and all. So that's the 13th. We have a meeting next Thursday that's a regular meeting. The plan was duplex, triplex, preview, and then returning to public nuisance. But given what we got and didn't get done today, I'm tempted to remove public nuisance from the plan and put back regulations and bylaws. What are people's thoughts on that? I'll talk to Pam. <laughs> I'm trying to get through a sort of good review of the bylaw and regulations so we can get some language and some mailings out to others. So that's why I'm trying to do but that. But we won't do the report next week. That's not on. No, the report, we're not going to have time. Um, and and this will give Shalini some time <laughs> instead of a week. Um, it, uh, we probably will not get to the report again till March 16th. Um, so March 2nd is the public hearing on the DeAngelis and Haneke, our proposal on zoning. Um, that's the only thing that is on that agenda. And I don't expect us to close the hearing that day. The planning board hearing will be the first, so we'll know Chris will be able to report out on the second um, where the planning board stands on their hearing and if they've continued, which I'm guessing they will, what date they've continued to. Um, but the plan is to only put the public hearing on the March 2nd meeting. Shalini. Did you, say, you did say you're going to send us a language to send out to our districts. You will I will get that out as soon as the meeting's over. I just can't multitask that well. <laughs> okay, quick question. Also, can I just clarify again? I know we, uh, did we decide the four occupancy limit what did we finally decide we call i mean we're going to describe it up front what pam was suggesting for and i'm going back to that because when we make the changes but can we just keep it then for tenant otherwise i'll have to change everything but if everyone really feels strongly about it i can go ahead and change it uh, otherwise i can just put four tenants slash occupants or i think you could do four unrelated maybe and skip the word tenant no, four occupants, right? She's saying she would have to go through the entire document yeah. and out the word for. So for tenant, as long as maybe at the beginning when you first reference it, put in parentheses hereafter or something referred to as the four tenant rule or something like something like that that says, but but do that somewhere in the beginning. The note is at the very end of the document, obviously, so you'll have to find. But um, yeah, okay. 
Um, any other questions regarding agenda or requests for agendas? We've got some very busy ones. I'm trying to keep our meetings within two hours. I'm not doing too well today. Um, so um, I'm trying, but just, Pam. Just to confirm, are you sending um, Shalini the, the notification of the listening session or am I? I'm going to send the whole council the notification. Okay. And I will do it in the next, once we're off, I'll just pull what you, uh, the, the email I got from you, Pam, I will basically pull and add a little preview to it to the whole council. Thank you. Okay. Great. Anything else? Anything I didn't anticipate that you guys want to bring up? Thank you for the extra 11 minutes, Kelly, and the rest of the committee. I and you all have time to get your seven o'clock meeting. <laughs> I have a seven o'clock and I have an eight o'clock. <laughs> so. Night is young. And Shalini has a seven o'clock. Yeah. So this is why we try to keep the two hours. So thank you all. I'm adjourning the meeting at 641. Thank you. See you later. Goodbye. Bye. Okay.